Hello nurses, this is Kevin with NursingCamp.com and these are my scribble notes on nursing in the NCLEX. Today's focus is on pulmonary lecture number 24, ventilator complications. In the previous lecture I talked about uh, alarms of the ventilator and it's coming from a sticky note found on NursingCamp.com, social media, Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest as Nursing Camp. Alright, let's get into it. ventilator complications. In this focus is more not so much on the machine but on the complications that the ventilator actually causes and those are specific to um, to uh, underlying causes now when we talk about fluid retention we're talking about patients who have CHF and they have decreased cardiac output once they have a decreased cardiac output they're gonna have an increase of fluid buildup now this can be either related to the positive pressure versus the negative pressure because we never have negative pressure breathing and when you're on a ventilator you're on a positive pressure system and what happens is, is that positive pressure causes fluid shifts and those fluid shifts results in edema and when you have edema you have to monitor that patient for that fluid retention because that can actually start to build up and become pulmonary edema um, also, the renin angiotensin system, because of the stress on the system, causes that increase of uh, fluid retention. And uh, the last thing would be humidification. Because as we talked about previously, with a person who's on a ventilator, you are bypassing the um, airway. And normally, airflow comes in and it's warmed up in this section. But with an ET tube, you're bypassing that. So it goes right into the lungs. Well, it requires increased humidification. And when we increase that humidification, it's actually a percentage of water. And that water actually goes through diffusion and actually starts to seep out. And what happens is they get increased edema from the excess amount of fluid. The next is oxygen toxicity. I talked a little bit about that when we talked about ventilator modes. And oxygen toxicity on a ventilator is very, very um, important to be monitoring. So when we're looking at monitoring, we said that generally sometimes a person is put on 100% oxygen um, when they're first put on a ventilator. But it's very important to start to decrease that oxygen um, down to 60. Because if it's greater than 60% FiO2, which is oxygen concentration, um, if it is greater than that for 24 hours, they can actually get necrotic and have um, oxygen toxicity. Oxygen is very toxic to the body because remember, room air is only about 21%. So our inflow of oxygen is actually pretty less. But when we're delivering oxygen, remember, we're delivering it right through an ET tube right into the lungs. So we want to be very careful about like not keeping a patient at a high FiO2. Um, so less than 60%, so you don't want to keep them over 24 hours. If they are greater than 24 hours, they're at risk for oxygen toxicity. Um, the next thing is, is that you also start to see hemodynamic pressure changes. This is important because of hemodynamics on ventilator. Remember, it's a positive pressure system. So you're going to be monitoring the PAWP, which is the wedge pressure, which when we're looking at the heart and the ventricles, we're looking at right atrial pressure. That's the pulmonary artery going out to the lungs. And when we're seeing fluid retention and increased surface volumes, that wedge pressure is normally 8 to 12. If it gets out to get greater than 12, that patient probably needs some Lasix or needs to be regulated because that hemodynamic principle is that positive pressure system. This is also monitored through a CVP. And that CVP is also acute because that's peripheral volume. That's in the fingers and toes, and that's another thing of edema. Also, we want to know that you know you might start to see decreased perfusion. So you want to make sure that you're monitoring the mean arterial pressure on a um, ventilator. So a lot of times they're on an A-line, and that A-line is uh, we're monitoring the dichrotic notch. And this is systolic, this is AV closing, a aortic valve closing, and systolic versus diastolic. And when we're monitoring this aid line, we're monitoring the mean arterial pressure. Remember, the brain requires 70 to 75 on the mean arterial pressure for perfusion. 
if it is less than 70, 75, um, you're going to have a decreased level of consciousness. And that's acute. Remember, the mean arterial pressure for the kidneys alone is going to need to be 60 to 65. So we'll monitor the BUN and creatinine for kidney perfusion. Um, next thing is the aspiration precautions. Now, on an ET tube, um, there is uh, two usually pilots. And in an ET tube, there is a, a balloon. And that's where we me measure the cuff pressures. So we want to make sure that this person is always at 30 degrees. And we also have what's called a VAP. Now a VAP tube, I'll talk a little bit about it in another lecture, but a VAP is another tube that comes off that is connected to a uh, constant pressure of 20 cm's. And what that does is, is that under this cuff, you start to get secretions building up. And the problem with that these secretions start to build up on this on this cuff and then they can seep down into the pulmonary tree. If they seep down there they can get pneumonia. And that's ventilated uh, acquired pneumonia. So this VAP tube is important for, for that because what it does is it suctions out this little tube suctions off this um, secretions that build up because the gut is generally dirty. And um, a person who's being fed and stuff like that um, on an ET tube, um, it's very important to maintain a patency of that, um, of that cuff pressure. The last thing to talk about is um, stress ulcers. Now, stress ulcers used to be curling ulcers and different things like that. It used to be a pretty big issue in the past. But since we got H2 blockers, um, they basically have prevented... Um, uh, ventilated assistant uh, stress ulcers and, and bleeding ulcers. And what those are is like protonics or H2 blockers. Um, a patient who's on, on um, H2 blockers or protonics on a ventilator, it's because the gut is at rest. And when the gut is at rest, it's, it's still producing hydrochloric acid. And what happens is, is that over the time, if, if there's no food in the gut, you actually can develop a, an ulcer. And now this ulcer is problematic because these bugs get out of the um, stomach because the gut is generally dirty, but they start to sit into an enterohepatic um, uh, vein where what happens is that they start to build up. And when these bugs build up, they actually get septic. This is prevented by H2 blockers. And those H2 blockers prevents this stress also from happening. So when we're looking at ventilator complications, we're looking at not only assessing the ventilator for sounds and you know high pressure versus low pressure alarms, there's also some problems that you have to monitor while a patient's on a ventilator. And you're gonna monitor hourly rate, tidal volume and alarm settings, but also you'll be looking for the boat coming while they're on the ventilator with these complications. Well, that's about it for me for uh, ventilator complications. Um, you can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, uh, Pinterest, Etsy, and nursingcamp.com. That's it. Nurse on. We'll talk to you next time.